These are the three questions I'm also encouraging you to ask throughout the course of the day. Have any of you been trying this out? I've just, uh, well, I get, try it, you have tried it? Okay. It, I do it, must, I must do uh, 15, 20 times a day now. I, whenever my mind, when I'm walking or driving or whatever pops in my mind, and I I'll just ask these f three basic questions. The first and the last questions recorded by, uh, in the scriptures, only in John's gospel, what do you seek? What you, that's the most important thing you'll find. And then the second question is, from the synoptics at Caesarea Philippi, who do men say that I am? But the more important question is, who do you say uh, that I am? Who do you say? And then third, the question, do you love me more than these? Which is also the last question of, of Christ. And so the these you get to fit in. Now here's the way I do it. I use, use this as a diagnostic tool. And it just takes a few moments, really. Now that I've done it so many times, it's become a part of my routine. And so um, I just, when I think of uh, what do I seek, what do I want more than anything else at this very moment, you see? And then secondly, um, who, who is Jesus to me right now? It's a good question. Who is he to you? And then third, do, do you love me more than these? So it's always about him, you see. I seek you, and you are all and I treasure you more than anything else. And I find it's a recalibrator, and I want you to try using it. Um, I'm gonna ask you next week, if very likely, so give, me, uh, give it a go. And then I, with that, with, and these are the texts as well, the John 1 and John 21, as I say the first and last questions of Jesus, only, jo only recorded in John's Gospel. And then I always throw, I already prayed this, this in our prayer, opening prayer. If you, I don't know if you noticed it, but I prayed it uh, in there. And so this combination is really powerful for me. And I'm, I'm, because I care for you, I want you to give it a go. And it's that simple. Uh, any questions about how to use it? Because it's very important for us to try this out. It's, it's been extremely uh, valuable in my own uh, journey. Sure, sure. The one about the, the, this, the, let me see, this one here? Yes, uh-huh. And um, so again, this summarizes in a Trinitarian way my relationship with the living God. It's triunity. So I think, what's my role with the Father? Is it not to trust him? I will not understand him. You cannot understand the Lord, and, and that's why I stopped asking why a, long, a, a good while ago. And it's a good thing because it, you'll never understand. Even if he were to tol tell you, then you would have asked, that would raise another question. Why, but why that? And it would go on ad infinitum. You'll never understand the fringe of his ways. But you can trust him, and therein lies the issue. So then, with regard to the son, the abiding imagery, the abiding life of Christ, that he's in you and you are in him. And so, like, you are um, drawing your vitality as the branch would draw its vitality from the vine and then display fruit. And then the third is walking by the Spirit or keeping in step, You're not jump going ahead, not going behind. My tendency is to lag, uh, to go ahead, to jump ahead. I get a prompt, I think I'm supposed to do something, and I run with it. Some people lag behind. My tendency is, uh, so I know that. But just to raise this question, trust the Father, abide in the Son, walk by the Spirit, really contextualizes my life journey. And so these two things then, um, I want you to try using. I'm gonna turn this into a card or something, make it easy for you, just a simple three by four, that you can carry it with you. But really, it's something that I invite you to do on the ongoing basis, it's that, and then the other exercise that I um, have been encouraging you to pursue is uh, the handbook to prayer, and I might as well th throw that at you too. Now today is the 30th, is it not? Yes. And so I'd have to, I'd have to jump ahead, uh, but in, it's still the first month, the 30th day. That's so it's just that simple. So that means then that January will be the first month again. So it's a three-month cycle, and it's a no-brainer then. And here's the beauty of that. So, oh, I, oh, look at this. I missed the uh, 24th on this. On this I haven't, but uh, on this uh, iPad I have. So I just jump, jump ahead. I don't worry about the ones I missed. That way it's never a burden on you. If you missed a few days, go to the de calendar day 
and that way it's never going to be a problem. But I love the idea of us as a body of believers actually praying the same scriptures at the same time, effectively, and quite effectively the same day as each other. There's a sort of power to that, and that's why we made these available to you. Um, and if you don't have a copy of Hammer to Prayer, I'd encourage you to, to use that. So please give that a go, and uh, that is my little daily discipline for you. And the reason why this is apropos, of course, is because that's precisely what we're discussing, is the spiritual disciplines. And these I've just given you are two little mini-disciplines, you see, that are illustrative of the spiritual disciplines in general. Now, these two I kind of made up, but they're, I find them to be useful for me, and if they're useful for me, they're likely to be useful for others. So the uh, methods that we use them when we think about the spiritual disciplines are, are variant. Now, there's a whole array of these disciplines, and uh, second to the spirit, it is your will, which is your most powerful force or asset that you possess. So apart from the Holy Spirit, your will, your, the power of your will, and that's where disciplines come in. As we've described before, there is a balance, a synergy between divine sovereignty on the one hand and then human responsibility on the other. So as Augustine, uh, is, it's attributed to Augustine, I'm not sure if I've found it exactly, but without God, we cannot. Without us, he will not. Let me repeat that because it really cap captures a lot. Without God, we cannot, but without us, he will not. He, you're not going to just suddenly wake up and be spiritual. You see the idea here? It, it's, it's not going to happen. There's a choice. There is a long obedience in the same direction, as Eugene Peterson calls it, a long obedience. And this long obedience means that you are not on a sprint. You're in a marathon, and you're to run your race with diligence. Um, and you're to not compare yourself with the others, but fixing your eyes on Jesus, you run your race, so that you will finish well. So choices that you make throughout the uh, course of your life then either empower or enervate your will. You see, you can actually get a flabby will, and I'm afraid that's what's happened in many cases. So as I've, I have become fond of saying it, most people have very anemic intentions or values. They don't want enough. And that's a very important thing. It's, it's, it, the, the sermon to read, I've mentioned it multiple times, is The Weight of Glory by uh, C.S. Lewis because that is a very a powerful portrait of what we are intended to do. So when I think about uh, The Weight of Glory, at the very beginning of that e essay, is a great thing. He makes this statement here that um, it's an appeal to desire that he's using, you see. And he says, um, the, the concept here is if we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. And as he goes on to say, we are half-hearted creatures fooling about with, with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what it meant by an offer of a holiday at the sea, we are too easily pleased. And so what is he saying? We don't desire enough. In fact, you should long for so much that you finally admit that only the transfinite and the transtemporal will do. Anything else in which you fish fix your ultimate allegiance will let you down, and it'll be an idol that will break your heart because you see you were not meant for that. Again, to use Augustine's well-known expression, you have meant us, made us for yourself, O Lord, and I bet some of you can repeat the last half. And our hearts are restless, and restless until, they rest until they find their rest in you. I want you to think of that because you see, if you were meant for God, if you were meant for the transfinite and the transtemporal, and you were because you are a spiritual being as an image bearer, you then are meant to be one who is conformed to his image so that you are a spiritual being and you are a relational being, you see, as God is. And you were meant for infinite 
the things. He is the infinite source of the transcendentals, of beauty, of goodness, and of truth. Beauty, goodness, truth. And that is how he approaches us in the natural world, through beauty. And, we are, and if we have eyes to see and ears to hear, we realize that God has created the universe in such a way that everything in the natural order is designed to point beyond itself to moral and spiritual truth for those who have the eyes to see and the ears to hear, but you have to attain that. You have to train yourself. It's the will, you see. So my desire for you is that you would desire more than the world would offer, that you would, uh, again, and I often put it this way, I'm just kind of repeating things I've said multiple times before, but when I think about these nine Ps, I'm sure there are more, but my alliteration, you see, um, you, can, you can begin to shoehorn things if you're not careful, but I think these are all true. These are idols for destruction. If these are things, there's nothing wrong with any of these to some degree if they're used in the right way in the right uh, sense, but if they become the basis of your identity, then there's a problem, you see. Then, you're, then, as Calvin put it, the heart is an idol factory. We make and invent idols, but we're not worshiping Moloch and Baal and uh, Astarte and so forth. They're not physical objects that we bow down and worship, although people still do that all around the world. It still amazes me. Nevertheless, we think we're more sophisticated. May I tell you, your gods are still there and gods can serve us, uh, or, or destroy us, rather. So that these are all, there's nothing wrong with any of these things to some degree, but if they become the end of all, then there's a danger. If they become um, some kind of a rival to the love of God, because God is a, love, is a jealous God. What does that mean? You know, I found out that Oprah Winfrey basically uh, uh, left Christianity or, or eschewed Christianity. You know why? Because of the idea of God being a jealous God. Well, that's not right. She thinks, well, she's missing the entire point. There's a holy jealousy and there is a fleshly jealousy. The holy jealousy, and you know what it is if you're a parent. You are jealous for your child's well-being. That's what a proper jealous. You, you're jealous for their good, you see, and you would protect him or her. Do you see the point? There is a holy jealousy, and that's what it is. God is jealous that you would not waste your lives and destroy yourselves on inferior things, but that he wants you to pursue the one thing most needful, the pearl of great price, the treasure hidden in the field. He wants you to have the best because you were meant for the best, but only he is big enough to sustain that aspiration. Nothing less will do. And so I say that and by the way, this is an interesting diagnostic. I've decided this is a diagnostic tool. You can actually decide which one of these things or which combination, because it's always a combination, you see, which one of these things would, uh, would we particularly be interested in. So it may be a combination of maybe a little bit of here, here. And so this might be about a, a seven in my life, and this is about a two, and this is a, a three. You see, you could actually use it as a diagnostic tool because we're all pulled by these things. Oh, if I only had that or that. So, so for, for some people, power is, more, is bigger. For some people, it's possessions because they draw that as their source of identity. Do you see the concept? But in every instance, though, they're not enough because this is what you need. And not a one of those, none of those will produce that. None of these will produce love, joy, peace, will they? At the end, we know it's true. That is indeed the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit, indeed, love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And you are meant for these as you walk in the Spirit. And so God's asking you net then to desire more, desire him above all else, above all goods. And in doing so then, you are going to find yourself as being satisfied because when God is glorified, you're satisfied. And so using your choice, what do you seek? What do you want? And that's why I, I, that's why I brought this to mind. So Jesus' opening question his first question, what do you seek, defines everything. Because what do you long for more than anything else? What do you want? The heart becomes conformed by that to which it aspires. You're conformed by your highest love, your highest pull. And you will be shaped by that, whether for ill or for good. You're going to be shaped by that. So ask yourself again, what do you seek? 
Because if, if, if you're like most people, you're seeking the tawdry of things of this world and not the enduring things of eternity. Because remember, and it's hard for us to imagine this, this world is so much with us. Remember that you're indeed an, a, a spiritual being, that your deepest self is not seen. It is hidden with Christ in God, it's your spirit. And if the scriptures are correct, then Paul says then, if, you, if the, then we've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth, for your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. You haven't been revealed yet, but you're seated with him at the right hand of the Father. And yet in this world, as amphibious beings, we're tethered to this world in, for a few decades, just a few. They go by quickly. And it's wise for us, therefore, to live as if we only have one year left. Wouldn't it be smart to do that? Never presume on more. And that way you live with eternity in mind and you begin to cultivate a, a heart for home, an aspiration for a longing for that. So what do you will? What do you want? It's, if, it's, if it's something on this that earth can provide, it's not big enough. That's why I stress this. So you have to train your will. And the way you train your will is to cultivate desire until you desire more than anything else, him. The transtemporal, uh, tr trans transfinite wellspring of beauty, goodness, and truth. Only he's big enough. And if I desire you, what do you seek? I seek you. And I will um, brook no rivals, as he says, and therefore, what, do you love me more than these? That last question, you see, it becomes very critical. But you see, amplifying your vision of Jesus, the, the second question, who do you say that I am? actually amplifies your aspiration as you get to know him better and better. So our desire that I may know him and the, pow and, the fellowship and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. This is a process that requires the word of God. It requires prayer and it requires suffering. There's no way around it. You can't do an end run around it. And so it's a necessary um, component. So here's how I put it then. We have uh, anemic values. We don't want enough. Because of that, we have sloppy thought lives. We put up with stuff we shouldn't be thinking about. We expose ourselves to things, and we're not disciplining that. And then third, we have flabby wills. That the, that the less you use your will for choosing the thing you know you should do, your will becomes enervated, becomes weak, it's not being exercised, and as a result, you get flabby. And after a while, your capacity to choose even when you want to choose is diminished. So it, it sneaks up on you, doesn't it? Um, so this concept, uh, the idea of the frog and the kettle, you've all heard that idea, and when it it's heats up, you see it, then it gets too enervated. Actually, the thing's smarter than we are. We're the ones who would get, just keep on getting so weak and that finally we realize, hey, we're in a, we're in a kettle that's getting uh, hotter and hotter. Better jump out of here. By the time you realize it, you don't have the energy to do so. You've been so emaciated. The frog's smarter than we are. He jumps out. But many people just get hotter and hotter until when they realize they're fixed, they're in. That's a good Southern expression. I'm in a fix where I'm fixing to do that. Remember that? When I used to leave, live in uh, um, Monroe, Louisiana as a boy, I used to use those phrases, I'm fixing to or I'm rec reckoning. But whenever I went back to New Jersey, as I did, I stopped using those words. And I didn't tell them about grits at all. That no one knew about grits. Uh, so, but the idea of the, the fix that you're in, that, that God has put you in, a, uh, that you seem to be in a mess, and how do you get out of it? So the desire we should have is then to free ourselves from the pull of this world, to have strength and authority and power so that we are people of God who manifest as living epistles the life of Christ. So that's why... You don't want to have, an, uh, uh, again, anemic intentions. I want you to desire infinity. I want you to desire eternity. Bigger than, that's better than the house. It's bigger than your children's welfare. It's bigger, because you see, if you have him, here's the beauty, everything else is thrown in. So if you give him, pursue him above all else, above all other goods, above all other desires, 
then the amazing thing is you not only have him, but the best things of this world are thrown in as because he gets to define what that looks like and then you begin to conform to his image. So that as you then have a stronger desire, then you can monitor your thought life so that you can discipline yourself, so that you're thinking and renewing your mind so that then you have a stronger will as you practice it. What do I will then? That I will become like what, that which I value. As I just said, valuation, anemic values. So if you don't value enough, then you're going to be diminished. Any questions on that, uh, these concepts? Because it's basic stuff, but yet you have to recur re it has to return again and again. So the spiritual drift disciplines, here's their purpose. It's training, not trying. That's a huge difference. You're not trying, you're training. You are in training and we are in training in this world. We're training to prepare ourselves for our eternal citizenship in the Father's house. So this world, as I like to call it, is a soul-forming world. Your spirit is already perfected, but your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions, your imagination, your desires, your aspirations, and so forth, that needs to be trained. And you are called to become more and more in your practice who you already are in your position. This is who you are. So you're a new being, but you also are what? A becomer. So you are called in this life to become more and more conformed to who you already are in Christ, becoming conformed to his image. So you train your will, and it's training in righteousness. Now, there are two kinds of uh, disciplines. Uh, there are different ways of describing them, this one way. You know, there, 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 those, there are two kinds of people in the world, by the way, those who, who divide the world into two kinds of people and those who don't. You can make it up as you go. But this is one way of looking at them. Disciplines of abstinence, that you choose not to do a thing. Disciplines of engagement, where you do a thing. So that's one way. There are other ways of doing it, though. Um, so you stop doing something or you start doing something. It's pretty simple. Remember, though, the key thing about the disciplines is there never ends in themselves. What are they? They are means to the end of knowing him and becoming like him. They're means to intimacy. They're not just things that you do because you have to do them. That, then it'd be death dealing instead of life giving. So solitude and silence, uh, we're, we're gonna start with uh, some of the disciplines of abstinence then. And so solitude and silence. Um, solitude is the most fundamental of the disciplines. As a discipline of abstinence then, um, having a solitude with, with, with the Father, having solitude with God, it's not that you're alone. You actually, you, you're never alone, but you have this solitude with him. And it's a good thing for you to look for places and create con sets, situations in which you can get away. It moves you away from the world then, finding ways of, of, of solitude into the presence of the living God. And so and when I think about that, it distances us uh, from noise and distraction, schedules. So you need to, if we don't have a little places, little windows in our life for this, you're just gonna become human doings instead of human beings. And so you want to, you are called, as I like to put it, loving well, learning well, living well. So it's the heart, the head, the hands, the being, knowing, and doing, inside out. So you're dis these give us a point of view, a perspective, a place of strength and dependence and reflection and renewal. So we need to create and shape those kinds of places or they're not, they're not just gonna spontaneously happen. You can be pretty sure of that. As, you've, uh, as you know, any bad thing left to itself, any bad uh, habit left to itself requires no reinforcement to keep it. No way at all, you just, keep, you just slide into it. But a good habit, something you want, well, that will require reinforcement, won't it? Because it'll slip through your fingers once you do it. So that's the nature of this. So when I think about uh, solitude and silence, there, and I'm just g g giving you a general overview, this is all in conform to his image, but also more fully explicated in Dallas Willard's uh, fine book, The Spirit of the Disciplines, and uh, uh, 
also Richard Forster's Celebration of Discipline. There's a whole array, array. There's a lot of literature that grew up. I think starting especially in the 80s, um, people became, Protestants became more aware of uh, what Catholics were doing all along in terms of the disciplines. It's interesting. Uh, but th it's become now more a realization <laughs> that these things have value and that actually Jesus used to do them. So what, um, it's, just think of how nutty it is. If Jesus did not regard these disciplines as optional, disciplines like prayer and study and fasting and all the other things he would do, what gives us the arrogant supposition that they're optional for us? If you want to imitate the master, you have to imitate his practice. So therefore, <clears throat> we, re but the, we, we make the blunder of regarding them as optional. You see, part of the solitude and silence that Jesus, has, we know, did, and we could study that and see, he would often go to lonely places to be by himself, you see, and then he would invite his disciples uh, to do so. They confront harmful inner patterns and forces and that nurtures depth and perspective and purpose and re resolve. In fact, uh, we've created a, um, a, a kind of a guidebook to a day of reflection with God or a day with God or a half a day with God. And... Uh, we're going to have to, have to put those out in a little booklet. It's one of the little booklets we need to make and make it easy for you to have a day or a half a day with him. Because you get a perspective and a resolve that you wouldn't get in the movement of life. <coughs> Silence is a catalyst of solitude. They go, these two disciplines are twins. They go together because silence creates that solitude as, as a way. It prepares the way for inner seclusion and listening. And as you know, our prayers are so much of our own words that we often don't let the spirit get a word in edgewise. So prayers of listening, listening prayers and pausing, those silences can be very important. Inner seclusion and listening to God is what's going on. So this is just a brief overview of, of uh, several this, this of the standard disciplines, or different lists of them. I'm just giving you a big picture of them, and there are sources I can provide for you where there's much more if you want more. <coughs> Prayer is, of course, a relationship. It's part of a relationship. You have to communicate. And so communication is the key to good relationships. And that involves both speaking and listening. And hearing that, so that's why the word of God, if we pray it back to God, then we are actually responding to his word. We're hearing, we're receiving from him in the word, and then we're offering our response to it. That's why in Hamburg to Prayer, the thing I want for you is not just to read the texts, uh, and it always starts with adoration, because let's be honest, what people actually normally start with adoration in their prayers? Very few, but it's the most common in Scripture. So that's why it's got a, the form, is you need a form, and it starts with God and ends with him. But the idea, though, of praying Scripture, now we elevate our thoughts to higher thoughts of ourselves uh, than, than, than we would choose. It's Scripture. And then, here's the key, then the freedom is your prayer, you stop and pause to add your own thoughts. It's not just reading it, you're interacting. So you quiet yourself and respond to what the, the text. I usually tell people uh, uh, when, uh, when I'm suggesting that, that method and, and tell you the same here, that, um, that it's probably best then for you to try reading these maybe slowly, two times would be good. Just read them slowly, either out loud or quietly, two, uh, two times. And then after doing that, then you pause, you see, to express your thoughts. And th before you move to the next. That way, it's a dialogue, isn't it? You're hearing, and you're then responding. And that's what prayer is. But the idea, as well as it's a balanced diet, it'll take you by the hand and say, okay, now let's do this. And then you ask the spirit to search your heart and so forth. So that's exactly the, the, what I mean by this concept of uh, dialogue or communion with God, a meeting place to receive grace, to release burdens, and to be honest. If you're not, it's, it's foolish to uh, have pretenses with before God. It always amuses me when some people get into a funny way of speaking when they pray uh, because they suppose God needs to hear it that way, as if it's going to impress him. He wants honesty, not, not showmanship. We're more conscious of the pe when we're praying out loud of the people who are around us than we are of him. So it's a matter really of uh, seeing it. 
This is a place where you get and I get to uh, receive grace and to release burdens and to be honest. To be able to do that then, it's a, 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 a place where you um, are a- able to relate to him in this way. When I think about Hebrews chapter uh, 4, for example, it talks about the value the, of the power of, of prayer. And so at, in, at, at the end, where he speaks about this idea of the, um, the prayers that, we, that we've been given, that we're, we're called to have a rest in him and so forth. But we have this great high priest and he's passed through the heavens. He says, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. This is a high priest who actually identified with us so much that he became one of us. It's the most astonishing concept. He's been tempted in all things as we are. Somehow he was temptable, but he was impeccable. He did not sin, and yet he was still t- temptable. So he understands what it's like when you're going through temptation. And so he tells us this invitation, therefore, let us draw near. That was actually the original version of Hammer to Prayer. What would become Hammer to Prayer was a one-month guide and was called Drawing Near. But let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. You see, Jesus has made the way of access open before the Father. And so we can be confident at this throne In spite of his awe and his power, we also are his children, and therefore we have access. And we can receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And so that is clearly what we often do. We need mercy, grace, help in our times of need. And so that is really what's going on here. Uh, Releasing burdens, being honest before him. And so there are structured times but there are also informal times of prayer that you should consider. And that's why I don't want to limit prayer to merely um, an exercise of, uh, in a formal time, though critical that that may be. Having special structured times is good in your schedule, but there's other thing, the rest, what do you do the rest of the day? You see, and that's why I talk a lot about practicing his presence. And because you can continue to pray, and you can pray for people as you're driving, you can enjoy the created order and make that a source of adoration as you see beautiful trees, as I've been seeing along the way today in my drive here. It was a lovely drive because I saw beauty of color that you don't get to see very long and often. But it's just, take it in, treasure it. May the last be the last time you ever get to see it in this earth. So it's a nice way of seeing it that way. Take it as a treasure. And so um, that's the ongoing dialogue. And so what you're doing is seeking to practice his presence. And I have a whole book I wrote on that called Life in the Presence of God. And, if, and then I decided, well, you know, this is so important because it's not an option. He made it a command, didn't he? What did he say? Abide in me? Did he say, set your mind on things above? Uh, where Christ is? Didn't he tell us to uh, walk by the Spirit, uh, to love God and love our neighbor, which is what you just said in the morning, in the afternoon? Um, he told us to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to him, to God the Father. You see what I'm saying? These are not options. These are mandates. These are commands that he tells us to do, yet we regard it as an option and always point to Brother Lawrence. Oh, isn't that lovely? Wouldn't it be nice to be like him? That's the misuse of it. If for, for that monk, it turned out that uh, he knew, discovered that he can praise God as much in the kitchen as he could in the church. Well, you can too. Would well, you have to be some special person to do that? So you can be praying while you're making a meal, while you're taking out the garbage, while you're going on a walk or anything else. There's no sacred, sacred or dichotomy. But somehow we have ac- accepted a low, low, low standard that's utterly sub-biblical. And as a consequence, our power is greatly diminished because we're not practicing his presence. And so that is part of our, de- our, our time. So you need both, I think it's good to have formal times, but then ongoing dialogue. Journaling. This is, I'll be honest with you, this is one of my weak ones. You know, we, um, I just, I do it sometimes, but not as much as I do. I, I suppose I have certain ways though, because I, cr- I do create these, these um, ideas, this list of thoughts and things like that. So there's a kind of journaling that goes on. Maybe it's not the, today I did this thing, 
But I, but I do have ways of doing that. But a kind of spiritual diary can be uh, very effective. Recording insights or feelings and experiences. And I do realize that I do record insights. I have lists of these. Um, they're kind of an interesting thing. I just I can't resist it. These are some of my, uh, my thoughts. Um, and there's a lot of them, you see. They just go on, on and on, you see. Um, and on and on and on. And so like this. And so it's kind of, well, but then I have a nice short list of these things as well because the short one is more accessible. So we're no longer defined by the pain of our bounded past but by the joy of our unbounded future. That's, that's a journal. You know, that's an entry, you could say. Uh, or I could say this one at the top. God, rede well, let me just see. Let me do, 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 do. Ah, this one. Restoration requires wreckage. And so uh, the way I put that then is if I go to these things here and if I go to my pensées here, um, uh, so then I can go it like that. It's much easier. See, now I've got them bigger, you see, like that. Um, getting old isn't an option, for example. Getting wise is. Anything worth pursuing will always be costly, but a realistic cost-benefit analysis reveals that we'll only flourish by paying the dreadful price tag to gain wisdom. There's an awful price, but it's going to be worth it. We're called to live with an eternal impact in the temporal arena. So I guess I, I could say that's journaling. You see, I hadn't thought of it that way. Love abundantly, think soundly, work heartily. So again, loving well, learning well, living well. Stop believing and hoping and trusting in gods that don't exist. We just talked about that. Uh, our joy must not depend on earthly outcomes. It must rest in eternal outcomes. We must never condition our joy through the lens of the temporal, and so forth. Um, I, I won't go to all these things, but um, add them to your story. Um, leverage remorse and regret into reminders of the unbounded home, joy of home because he's going to redeem what he allows. So I suppose these are, uh, this, this is a journal. I, so I was wrong. The idea of, re, of related to disciplines of prayer and me meditation and study. So you take your insights, and that's where, because these insights that I wrote down are the fruit of reflection. And so you just, uh, so you do that. And I'm now thinking out loud here because I've got whole, a lot of things. I collect all kinds of crazy things. And that's kind of journaling to create, like the Museum of Beauty. I have a whole presentation that uh, it's kind of fun to realize this. I'm thinking out loud having a discovery with you while we're, while we're together. So, for example, if I think of uh, this, like this, is a, this would be a kind of a journal. Um, so I have different categories of snowflakes. I won't go into the details there, but they're amazing. But um, this is a marvel and a wonder. So I just created a whole collection here that are stunning because these are things that are of a standard of quality that are only in the last decade that we can see it with this excellence because there are new techniques that are developed. And, and this, to me, is a wonder and a marvel, as you can see. So that's a kind of journal, isn't it? Because I'm collecting things. I collect rooms. I collect things, diatoms and everything. So look at how wonderful this. I'm coming up to one of my iconic ones that I have. Um, the, the, all kinds of things and the reason why they're made, and they're never alike. And this, the structure is exquisite. And these are things, by the way, in Scripture, in the days, in t or, uh, not until the microscope did we realize these existed, and only in the last few decades, and now, especially in the last decade, have we been able to see it with this degree of excellence and wonder. This is my favorite, I think, in many ways. There's something absolutely magical about this thing. It is, ex it is exquisite. And this is a snowflake. Just so think about that. It's just to be a marvel and wonder at the one who can make s systems that create structures that we correspond to. This is, this is like, uh, this looks like a fern, you see? Like a fern. And so you, th these are structures that we have. So that would be a kind of a way of, of journaling now. I'm thinking out loud. I'll stop thinking out loud in front of you. But that's, that's another way of journaling, I just realized that I do. So I guess I c I'm going to change my view of journaling. Um, I don't have a diary. I don't keep a diary as such, but I do have these things. It's good to, if, if God gives you an insight, put it down somewhere. Um, and so um, it enhances personal reflection and re perspectives from God and Scripture. And so I, I surely do have that. And it's, I guess, another form of prayer, it seems. 
It's another way of re interacting and responding to him in journaling. Give that a try uh, and think about your practices. And it would be an interesting thing for you to write down something, an insight, a spirit-given insight, and meditate upon that. That's really uh, what I mean by that. Um, again, um, these are, there's a bunch, I'm just giving you a high, just bird's eye overview of the standard disciplines, and here's your, what's going to be the case. Your personality, you, some of you will be inclined more to some and less to others. I'm that way. If you're more introverted, you're not going to as m enjoy disciplines like of worship and fellowship and celebration as a person who's extroverted would do and so forth. So we will then adapt them according to our needs, but they're, they're not optional. Study and meditation is obviously a key to the whole process of the renewal of the mind, and that is what we're called to do, that we renew our mind, Romans 12 invites us to. Study, reading, observation, interpretation, application. There are lots of methods that are available, and um, I could provide any methods if you want. There's, there's various methods of analytic, uh, analytic and synthetic, but it's devotional reflection on the beauty of nature and on gifted authors is another way of meditating. So meditation is one that's really often overlooked, and people then don't do enough of that, where you just stop and just reflect on that. And by the way, what amplifies my meditation is music. So I really invite you to do that. I've shared with some of you some of my playlists, and I have what I call contemplative playlist, and I have a contemplative best, and then I have classical gems, and then I have contemporary gems. And so I find, according to the need of the moment, I will choose something on something. So here, on my drive here, I was drive, uh, playing one of my favorite <coughs> uh, film scores. Um, and it is by Hans Zimmer, and it is uh, music uh, to the Thin Red Line. And if you haven't heard that, it's well worth it, and, and you, I promise you, you can use that as a meditative background because it just involves you. Um, but I'd be glad to share three of my playlists with you if you'd like. I could send it to, perhaps to Diana. Alfred, would that be the way to do it? Just to send the, per, the playlist, what do you think? Yeah, I think that'd be the way to do it. One of you remind me to do that. I'll send it to her. What's wrong with trying it out? because I have found it to be a force multiplier in worship. And that's why the Psalms were written to music, because music brings you down into another level, especially beneath, uh, under the iceberg, into the iceberg, down to the substrate of, of your emotions and so forth. And why are you in despair? Why are you cast down? From the depths of, of despair to the heights of joy, music amplifies that. And that's why often <clears throat> the superscriptions in the Hebrew will actually say to the choir direct, director, and sometimes will give the name of the, the tune. And it was apparently an antiphonal choirs <clears throat> set to music. So I don't know what it was like, no one does. Uh, whether, it was, uh, whether it was some kind of um, pentatonic scale or some variation of that, but at least, and the nature of the instruments. Um, so we, he d describes on the cymbals and high praises on the, uh, tr on the or trumpet and so forth, all these different instruments that are described. But I claim that when I meditate, it's a way of taking scripture and then helping me just, uh, re especially if it calms my soul, then it can be a powerful entry inv invitation. So, and then I do the beauty of nat nature and of gifted authors as well. And I'm out of time, but the last thing I'll share with you, I just throw one, one thing in here, is this. So another thing I do is uh, I'll look at uh, this, and I will set this to music. And so what I will do is have selections from these kinds of images, you see? He's giving you, uh, he's, I don't know if I want him to greet me that way. But look at this wonder on every order of magnitude. And we are, we are in a wonderful, exquisite planet on, on the macrocosm, the microcosm, and the midicosm that invites us to see. And I must tell you, when I do this, this can also be a source of amplification in prayer, wouldn't it? Especially you put music on there, and then you're meditating on a text of scripture. Oh God, my God, how excellent is your name in all the world, you see? Let's close in a prayer. Father, we thank you for our time together, and we ask that you would uh, grant us the grace of holy aspiration, that we would ask ourselves those questions. What do we seek? What do we long for? What do we desire more than anything else? And who is Jesus for us this day? 
Who do we say you are? And then do we love you more than these? That we want you to be first and foremost. And in loving you first, our lesser loves will find their proper order and be empowered by the love of Christ in whose name we pray. Amen.